When we had metal technology, we made money out of metal. After metal, we had paper technology, and so we made money out of paper. Humans tend to do this. And now, of course, we have software. We're not just keeping track of money with software, we're making money out of software. Bitcoin was the first to do it in a decentralized way. This is the reinvention of money yet again, regardless of what it's made with. Money is simply the distillation of a shared confidence in the future. It's what we call a belief network effect. Money is simply a belief held by a lot of people, a collective trance. Always in the past, belief in a currency formed around a hierarchical network topped by a king or a queen and his or her armies, a pharaoh, an emperor, a czar, a president. And prior to the U.S. Civil War, there were hundreds of regional currencies operating in the U.S., each centered around one strongman or another with his hierarchy under it. For the hierarchical pack animal that we are, hierarchy with an alpha king on top is understandable by all the people in the network, and thus it's stable. That's why when the king issues a currency and tells people to use it, people believe in it. This strong man-backed fiat currency approach has worked for 6,000 years or more, but with Bitcoin, it's different. Instead of a king or central authority creating the belief and then controlling the currency, Bitcoin doesn't have a hierarchical network structure with a strong man at the top. It's a decentralized network structure. The fact is, the majority of the world is still skeptical of Bitcoin, and this is why. The asset itself is creating nothing. Uh, watch out. You all can do whatever you want, and I don't care. Okay? <laughs> People aren't used to having currencies backed by a decentralized network. There isn't a hierarchy with a believable person on top to define what they should believe in. It's not the same pattern. To create the belief network effects necessary for the existence of money, hierarchical networks use power from the top, while decentralized networks use ubiquity. Crypto changes the nature of money in an historical way, because unlike gold or paper money, crypto is a native creature of the new global network. Unlike fiat currencies, it isn't constrained by geography or by time. This is a huge difference. Bitcoin's product is a currency, and more specifically, a, a store of value. Its currency doubles as, let's say, shares, and we can all buy and sell the coins as we would traditional stock. And in this view, Bitcoin's market cap would put it in the top few most valuable companies in the world, like other network effect businesses. So Bitcoin has core defensibilities. And of course, there are only four defensibilities native to the digital age that Bitcoin might use. There's network effects, there's brand, there's scale, and there's embedding. Network effects are, of course, the greatest of these. So let's focus on the network effects map. You can see the various network effects types and categories organized by color with the strongest network effects at the center of the map. Bitcoin's first and primary network effect is a belief network effect. It's the same mechanism you see with gold and with religions. The more people believe it's valuable, the more valuable it gets for everyone. The more times its price crashes and then bounces back, the more people will believe it has lasting value. Yes, Bitcoin is a bit like sand. It's not solid. But if you get a lot of sand and then layer some Ethereum sand on top of it, and then the sand of the thousands of other cryptocurrencies in existence, the Bitcoin sand gets progressively more solid as a result of growing belief network effects. What was once fluid and intangible transforms into something closer to rock. The Bitcoin's second network effect is a protocol network effect. Protocol arises when a computational standard is declared and all the nodes can plug into the network using that protocol. Traditional examples are Ethernet and fax machines. As the number of nodes that connect to the protocol increases, the network effect gets stronger. Bitcoin's third network effect is a two-sided marketplace network effect, and this is the second most powerful effect for Bitcoin. And Bitcoin creates two forms of marketplace network effects. First, a speculation between buyers and sellers of its store of value. And number two, a payments marketplace. The more nodes on the network buying, selling, and holding, the better for everyone. Bitcoin's fourth network effect is a two-sided platform network effect. This is where there are developers adding their products to the Bitcoin platform. The developers receive distribution to users as compensation for building and adding value to Bitcoin. Bitcoin also has a data network effect. And a data network effect occurs when as the data in the network grows, the value of the data for each user grows. 
Bitcoin's case, the transaction data is accreting on the blockchain in a way so that the amount of computation required to hijack the network increases, which increases security for everyone and thus value for everyone. Bitcoin's sixth network effect is a tribal network effect. Now, the main mechanism for tribal network effects is the creation of an in-group and an out-group so that the in-group can know who to help and to be loyal to. The out-group typically turns into the quote-unquote enemy. There are now Bitcoin maximalists who believe that Bitcoin should be the only digital asset we'll need in the future, and they actively denounce all other coins. So within the five years, Bitcoin will have 99% of the hashing power and 99% of the market cap. And finally, Bitcoin's seventh network effect is a bandwagon network effect. Now, these bandwagon effects typically arise when people are jumping on early and not wanting to be left out. In Bitcoin's case, these early supporters were financially and ideologically rewarded for joining early. And as the value of the token has grown, people have been wanting to jump on and not be left out. And because Bitcoin has the biggest worldwide brand in crypto and has the biggest market cap, the bandwagon effect is strongest compared to lesser crypto brands. And moving on to other forms of defensibility, Bitcoin has a strong embedding effect already because they're listed on all the exchanges where people trade crypto. They benefit initially by being listed at all so that they can attract more users. But more importantly, because of where they're listed on the exchanges, at the number one spot. Through preferred attachment, this will tend to keep them number one. Another key defensibility of the digital age is brand. Most people tend to be risk averse and avoid the unknown, so they are less likely to switch to an unknown or lesser known brand. Bitcoin is regularly conflated with the entire cryptocurrency space. Given its size, Bitcoin has competitors coming at it from all directions. First, the fiat currencies issued by nations, such as the US dollar and the Chinese yuan, the incumbents. Number two, they've got other digital currencies like Ethereum, Cardano, who are trying to take it down. And number three, gold, traditional gold. Of course, there are some external shocks that might negatively impact Bitcoin's network effects. We see three. First, fake transactions. Second risk is responsiveness of the Bitcoin DAO. The third risk is government intervention. They are the winners. They are the incumbents. They're the winners of the old regime. In our opinion, it's too late for governments to stop Bitcoin. The network math protects it. To sum up, crypto's here to stay. The reinvention of money is underway. Bitcoin will continue to be a big part of that story. Bitcoin created and is now embedded into the crypto ecosystem and the world's consciousness.